present in that moment, which enables him to give his all because of his sense of setting. And I've often thought about that in life in general, about how important it is to have a sense of where you are. You know how it is in, in relationships with other people. You're uneasy if you don't have a sense of where you are with other people. Or your relationship with God. It's important to have a sense of where you are in relationship to God or in relationship to the community of God's people, in relationship to, to the people of the world, the, the needy of the world, the privileged of the world. Always important to have a sense of where you are. And of course the church believes this in just the way it lives out its, its whole cycle of the church here. From season to season to season, it matters what season you're in, in order to, to be able to plumb the depths of the richness of that particular moment in, in the year. Now I say all of that because of the gospel story that we've just read, and because I want to be clear that today is not the Feast of the Transfiguration. I know you were worried about this issue. <laughs> but the Feast of the Transfiguration occurs in August, on August 6th. There is some esoteric reason why it's on August 6th and I, that I'm not really very familiar with, but that's when it is. So if you belong, to, for instance, to the Church of the Transfiguration, this is not your feast day. You have your feast day in August. And what you're going to celebrate in August, of course, is that event on the mountaintop. That spectacular scene that is um, the proclamation of Jesus Christ as shining in the world. It's a scene not unlike the one we celebrate on Ascension Day. It's it's not, it's not easily accessible to our understanding how a transfiguration can take place or how an ascension can take place. It it's, transcends our understanding of reality, but it's important in what it has to say about Jesus. So the Feast of the Transfiguration fits in there in the Christian calendar along with some of the not quite great feast days. It's not the same as uh, Christmas, Easter, Epiphany, those ones. It's a little bit more like All Saints Day or the Feast of the Annunciation or the Presentation in the Temple. It's, it's of that category. Uh, one of the 12 biggies but not one of the tip-top things. So that's, I tell you all that so you can get ready for August. <laughs> but now you say, why then do we hear this story that is the story of the Transfiguration if it's not the Feast of the Transfiguration? That's a great question. And we have to remember that we need to have a, a, a sense of where we are. Where we are in the telling of the story of Christ. And where we are is at the end of the season of Epiphany. And the season of Epiphany is, of course, that season that's, that we say is the season of the manifestation of Christ in the world. We hear a series of stories about how the, the uniqueness and specialness of Christ in the world is revealed in the season of Epiphany. We start with the, with the baptism of Jesus at the river and the voice from heaven that says, this is my beloved son. And we hear the, the, his first miracle in Cana of Galilee. And we hear his first sermon in the synagogue in Nazareth and the reaction to that. And this is the culmination story of how 
the light that Christ represents coming into the world in the person of Jesus is made manifest in the world. And so this, this story today is the pinnacle of the epiphany season. It's fulfillment in one sense. But you notice if you listen to the gospel, it doesn't stop on top of the mountain. And that's the critical thing. Because that's not the place we're in. We're not at the Feast of the Transfiguration. We, this story that we've heard today, comes down the mountain and immediately encounters the world again. What's happened is that these three disciples have gone up the mountain with Jesus. They're feeling a little sleepy, but they manage to stay awake. And while he's praying, he's transfigured. He's, his, his raiments shine like, like the sun. And then he's seen to be with two people, two figures, Elijah and Moses, the, the, the key prophet of all time for the Hebrew people and the key lawgiver. And they are conversing with Jesus and we even are told that what they're talking about. They're talking about what's going to happen to Jesus when he gets to Jerusalem. And then we all know the part about Peter who wants to say, oh, it's so great, we're here, let's build a little shrine for each of you. But before he can finish saying that, a cloud overcomes the whole thing and a voice says, this is my beloved, listen to him. And when the cloud lifts, there's no one left but Jesus. And then they go down the hill. And the next day, so it's a little, it's, it's a hill that they've been up and they come down. And somewhere along the line, they spend the night. And the next day, they're there with the other disciples. And the other disciples have obviously been busy because people have come to them to wonder about Jesus, to ask about him, to seek prayer and healing for themselves. And this one man comes out and says, Jesus, heal my son. He's got this awful affliction. He keeps having these seizures that makes him foam in the mouth shout, and nobody seems to be able to do anything about it, and this is my, my only son, and we are heartbroken for him. Can you heal him? Nobody else seems to be able to heal him. And Jesus says, bring him here, and as he's coming here, he's in convulsions, and Jesus heals him, and he is well. Think about Peter and James and John at the end of this second day. They're sitting around and they're saying, well, what have we seen in the last 24 hours? We saw this transfiguring a moment on the top of the mountain and we thought that this was going to be the climax of something, that this was a really extraordinary event that's going to transform our lives somehow. But it didn't. The next day, life's just the way it's always been. There's all these people who are hurt and broken. There's so much suffering in the world and it's right there just the same as it was before that funny event up the hill. And nothing has changed. And not only that, but but this healing and this ministry, which, which sometimes we can do, sometimes we can't do. And, and we tried to heal that young boy, but we couldn't do it. You would think, after that big thing we just saw on the mountain, we'd have some extra power we could use to heal. But we failed. And so what should we make about what happened on the mountain? And what happened with the healing? About our, our ability to heal people and our inability to heal people. 
What sense does that make? What shall we make of that, they say to one another? And, and I don't know what they say. I don't know what sense they make of that. I know that that night they went to sleep again. And they woke up the next morning and they followed Jesus. And they carried that mountaintop experience in their hearts. And they carried it with them as they went on this path through the brokenness of the world, through human suffering and human need. They carried that vision of the mountaintop with them all the way to Jerusalem, through the, the torturing of Jesus, through his death on the cross, they carried that vision that they had seen on the mountaintop. The mountaintop experience did not change their lives, did not change the world, but it empowered them. It empowered them in this kind of subtle way to carry on to walk further with Jesus. It empowered them, maybe, sometimes, to be able to heal the world. Maybe sometimes they were able to provide food to people who needed it, or healing to those who were sick. Maybe. But just as equally, they probably couldn't do that much either. They couldn't bring healing. They couldn't feed all the hungry of the world. They couldn't do the magnificent things they really wanted to do. They could do some. And they could keep walking with Jesus. And they walked with Jesus, and they carried the mountain with them in their hearts. Until, until he died on the cross. And then they sat around and said, do you remember the mountain? And that, today, is what we're called to do. The place where we are in this moment in the church year is not just the fulfillment of the season of Epiphany, but the beginning of the season of Lent. We take the mountaintop with us as we walk out the door and we walk into those places of need in the world, those places of suffering. And sometimes we can ease the suffering, and sometimes we can bring healing, and sometimes we can feed the hungry, and sometimes we can't. But we can carry the mountain in our hearts and keep walking with Christ.